What's up, everybody? What's going on? Everybody out there, another episode of Success After Lockdown Season 3. Yeah. New York, Florida edition over here. Yeah. I told you we got people from all over the world, man, that's making it happen. They're out here successfully coming home from all over the place, man. Uh, our guest today is to call himself the OCD Teller Bobby. Ah. Yeah, no question. Okay, in the building, got my boy Eric. You already know who he is. Yeah, welcome the to the Sunshine State, man. Ah. That's what you already know, man. We in Florida now, man. Ah, where we at? Florida. We just left New ah. York, man. We in the yeah. building. Ah, that's right. Palm trees, sunshine, and I can't say the rest. All right. <laughs> so, you know, I want to thank everybody out there, man, that's been tuning in, for following us. Like we said, we're trying to... Um, Showcase all men and women from all over the world, man. Um, at least all over the country that have been formerly incarcerated, have come home, you know, doing some things successful, giving back to their community, starting their own business. And most importantly, man, staying out of trouble and staying out of back of prison. Uh, and Bobby is one of them guys um, that has an amazing story. He's actually originally from Be More. Be more careful. Yeah. Maybe I already know. Uh, living in Florida is where we all come to to kind of retire and some come to restart. Um, with that being said, um, you already know he'd be up in the building with me. Um, and, and Bobby, let's welcome Bobby on the no show. No question. No question. He's in the building, man. I appreciate it, guys. Thankful to be here. Yeah, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure, man, to actually uh, you know, get you on the show. Like I said, um, our show is to always showcase brothers and sisters who have been formerly incarcerated, has been through the struggles, has been through the pains and the trials and tribulations, and got to a point in their life that they say, you know what, enough is enough. I'm tired of giving, you know, my time away. I'd rather make the best investment in my time and myself. Definitely. Not in a cell, but to be productive, not go back to prison. Everything outside of that is actually a plus. That's right. You know what I mean? In life. And someone that's giving back to the community. And and we when we look at giving back to the community, that could be so many different ways. You having your own business, you being an entrepreneur, you you know what I mean? You you working just, you know, for family. That's positive. You know what I mean? That's giving back to society in a whole. You know, so this is what we showcasing. This what this is what we highlighting. You know, that, okay, a lot of people in society have a perception that, you know, those of us that been in prison, we going back. But we here to show that a lot of us are not going back. A lot of us are doing, you know, positive things and staying focused and giving back to the communities. The communities is our, fam our family as well. Our families. Every Christmas, and touch on that, every Christmas I do a Christmas because when I was a kid, yeah. we couldn't afford toys. So I remember one year... My mother couldn't afford toys. Some guy come out of nowhere and bought toys for us. That's so right. now these last four years out of prison, every year it gets bigger and bigger. So I take about 1500 of my own money. Yeah. I just reach out. Hey, tell me who needs toys. I go buy gender, age-specific toys, everything. And that's what and we And give them away on about. Christmas Eve. That's and right. every year it's got bigger. So last year I did $8,000 in toys. Yeah. And this year it's supposed to be even bigger. Oh, we're going to get into that. Let's, yeah, do yeah. The, let's get this started. Yeah, so <laughs> no, with I'm that sorry. being said, yo, let's introduce again Bobby OCD. Tell us the reason to that name. And that's the reason to the madness behind it. I'll let y'all know if y'all seen my car, you definitely know. So, Bobby, let the people know, man. A little bit about yourself, where you grew up from, where you from, where you grew up Two at. Two parent home, one parent. Yeah, what you was know, that Talk like about you? your life, man. That's growing up. So I'm from I'm from Baltimore. I'm from South Baltimore. Be Big more, up to be more. Be more. I grew up. It was basically a two parent home, but it was it was a toxic two parent home. Mm. My mother and father used to fist fight. My father was like six five, two seventy. My mother maybe 5'10", I don't know, whatever her weight yeah. was, but they li literally used to fist fight. Like, I yeah. watched my mother run my father over. At one time, they bought an IROC Z28, and I hope I can get these pictures. My father was very vindictive. He filled the whole thing up with shaving cream, took the T-tops off, filled it up, then covered it in <laughs> shaving cream. And I still remember, and, and I, wow. my father, I found my father dead in 92 wow. of an overdose, but I Sorry. always wanted... Yeah, how many cans of shaving cream did it take to do this to this yeah. car? Like it's still, it's still, it's still. Every time Mind I think about it, it's like that's crazy. Yeah. But they were very abusive. 
they were together from the time they were kids. They were, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say up until my stepfather, my father was the love of my mother's life. Um, but watching them fight, watching everything, watching him leave, my mother putting restraining orders, him wanting to come get me from the babysitter, and and me having to choose because my mother told me you can't go with him. So now I got to sit there. My father's at the door wanting to take me. My mother saying you can't go with him, yeah. and come to find out later on the, the restraining orders were expired. But it's it's a hard choice to make. You see your father, who's your hero. Like the reason I don't smoke cigarettes is because my father hated cigarettes. Now he did heroin, nice. he did cocaine, he did everything else that yeah. I end up doing. But to this day, I've never touched a touched lit a cigarette. cigarette. No clue. So that was my hero, and uh, it 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 like went at me. So then when I found him dead. You know, I blamed myself for that for a long time because I was calling him to come down. Yeah, I, I call him every five minutes, and he would come. I'll be down in a minute. He was in the bathroom getting high, and so the last time I told my brother we're gonna wait ten minutes for him. So this was September 11th, 92, and uh, I waited ten minutes, and I called him. He didn't answer. My father loved joking, loved playing, mm -hmm. funniest dude you ever met. Mm -hmm. I went up and looked in the bathroom and he was spread out on the floor. And we didn't have a phone, so I had to run two blocks to somebody's house to use a phone. And uh, I blamed myself for that for a long time because I should have called him in five minutes again. You know, and people mm -hmm. told me I can't blame myself, but then Absolutely. after that, my father was gone. That's September 11th, 92. My father knew everybody in the neighborhood, so everybody knew me. And uh, September 12th, I was selling drugs. Like, I had never done, I played around, picked up vials, filled them up with soap, oh, no. never really sold them to anybody, just walked around with them to be yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? How, how old were you? I was 11. Yeah, I was 11 years old. So that, mm. that's the day my life changed. Like, I'm mischievous, do little dumb things, but I knew my father wouldn't be okay with me selling drugs if he caught me breaking into cars. But September 12th, that's the that's the day it all started. I can I can remember that day like wow. this. That's the day it all started. I went out looking, dudes on the corner, man, sorry, little Bobby, and I just started sitting on the corner. And then dude, go grab that for me, Bobby, give it to him. Yeah, yeah. And that's what it was right there. It was from that day. I it's, it's crazy. I can I know the day yeah. my life no completely question. changed. No doubt. What that's year a was pivotal that? moment for you. Yeah. That was ninety two. Ninety two. I think 92, we was out there at that time. Yeah. Yeah. We, was, was out, we was out yeah, there we ninety one, ninety two, we was out there in B more at the time. Mark Washington Darman Boulevard Ball, and Austin and Street. That. Smitty's Corner. Yeah. yeah, we used to be off of Baltimore Ave, Smallwood, Pulaski, yeah, Pratt, yeah, so, yeah, Montgomery. To, that's Lumberyard. I yeah, to, yeah. I used, to, I used to live right at Monroe and Wilkins. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. 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 It, it, was, it was a danger zone because I know even for us, it was a straight danger zone out there. So I can imagine as a little kid, 11 years old. So I used to get used for things like that. Like dudes, that would, that would dudes come from a Park Heights and all come down there. But if New York dudes came down in Big Town, yeah. they used to tell me I couldn't go to prison. Because right. I was 11, 12 years old. Bob, yeah. shoot at him. I remember dude Cressida coming through and I'm shooting at the Cressida. Don't know what the hell I'm doing. Yeah, just, yeah. just out there wanting to fit in so yeah. bad, right? It's the influence. Yeah. And that was, that was the thing is I was told as a kid I couldn't go to prison. Mm -hmm. But then later in life, I was told, you know, I, I was I was groomed to when you go to prison. Like I was never mm -hmm. told do right. something right. I was always told, Bobby, when you go to prison, you are gonna get tattoos, yeah. and we did that. Yeah. When you go to prison, this how you make a knife. When you go to prison, yeah, when you that. go to prison, and so that shaped my whole childhood. That yeah. I was I was going to prison. I couldn't yeah. wait. I mean, when I got sentenced, I was. You would have thought I was going to Disneyland. Like yeah. I was so happy. happy I, I was yeah. fulfilling that dream. That badge of honor. That yeah. badge of honor. That was it. Yeah. You know? That's that 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 distorted value of system. Honor. It shaped your value system. Mm -hmm. Seventeen Easy. years old. I got fifty years. I didn't know what I was in for. Like mm -hmm. I, it was going to be a joke. So, mm -hmm. so when you was out there and you remember, you know, um, picking up that first, you know, that drug and selling it and getting into that game, do you remember at any time? Can you reflect on any? moments at that time when you've seen any positive positive uh, uh, influences trying to, you know, sway you like somebody from an organization coming around or, yo, listen, come over here, man. Come to this boxing gym, man. You don't need to be in the streets. So when I was a kid, before my father died, there was a guy named Ben Getty. He had, it was called Ben Getty's Pigtown Boxing Club. And me and my cousins would go in there and box. He actually up and left one day. And I come to find out that uh, I think I think it was Bud, Bud Crawford or one of them. He ended up being his trainer later in life. But we didn't know where this guy went. 
So we would go in there and box. But after that, after he was gone, after my father died, I don't even think I was looking for anything. I think if somebody yeah. was coming, because we had like the police athletic league, like there were two of them that closed down, but we I wasn't even, even looking for that. I, I was in the that. park Nobody playing basketball. Ever. Yeah, I just wanted to be a drug. I just wanted to be a drug king. No man. That's it. I just wanted to make my name out here. Yeah. Wasn't even really making stuff. The dude I was working for, my mother was getting high, my whole house getting high. I lived in a shooting gallery. So I worked for a couple slices of pizza, take my brother some pizza, and every Friday he bought me an outfit. I wasn't even yeah. making ninety ten yet. So so your first your first time um locked up, what was your first incarceration for? Like? The first incarceration was for drugs. So I got caught hustling and that was a juvenile charge. And I only had a couple juvenile charges, stolen car charge, but then it got into the adult charges. So I got locked up for armed trafficking, armed trafficking, and then in a robbery for shooting. Yeah, so that, 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 when you said you got 50 years or something like that? That was for the shooting. The, like, how did that feel to you? Just because I know you said, like, we carry this with a badge of honor. We yeah. carry this stuff going to prison. I'm going to prison that first, when I was young, you know what I mean? Yeah. First time I went to prison, I was 14, 15. And going there, you know, it was like, listen, I'm going to Rikers Island. I'm from I'm from the Bronx, New yeah. York. So the Rikers Island was a badge of honor, to, you know what I mean, for yeah. me to go. So I'm I'm saying like, um, what was that 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 feeling for you now that you get over the young time? Now you're facing 50 years. So what did that look like to you and your vision? So it didn't even hit me until. I was so I, I I didn't come down to reality until I had like almost eight years in, like the first eight years of my bit were just let's run wild, let's make a name. So what? Right? Like, yeah, I got. I, I don't care about none of this. And and I got a funny story because when I was when I was seventeen, I looked young. When I was seventeen, I if, when I look at old pictures of me as a drug dealer, I'm like. I, if I ever bought drugs from me, I would have just robbed me. Like I would just, <laughs> so I look young and I'm in there and I'm coming in to make a name for myself, right? Yeah. And uh. And heavy in there, then with the BGF, the Bloods were just coming in. But so I'm arguing with this dude over a chess game. And I got make. I've only been in jail like three weeks, and now I got to make a name for myself. This dude, it was actually my fault. I was dead wrong. Touch a piece, move a piece. I accidentally touched the piece and then tried to argue my way out of it. <laughs> so coming from where I'm from, I, I heard the term toss your salad before. Yeah. But I never knew what it meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm arguing with this dude, and, and my boy see me arguing, dude from my neighborhood. He's bringing a knife to me. I'm, I'm walking down to the cell, and I'm, tell, I'm telling you right now, you come in this motherfucking cell, I'm gonna toss your salad, bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I look young, and the whole joint start laughing. I'm, oh, they think I won't do this shit, yeah, right? Yeah. So he come in with that. He's like, yo, what you just say? I'm gonna toss that bitch a salad. He come in here. He's like, yo, what? Are you what are you saying? Yeah. Like, fuck that shit. Come on. He's like, bro, do you know what that means? I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna bust his fucking head open. He's like, no. no. I mean, you're gonna lick that man's head. <laughs> and me and that dude, we end up becoming real cool after that. We would see each other along the path, and he'd be like, you still wanna toss my salad? And I'd be like, nah, 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 I don't feel that way about you no more, right? So it became a joke. That dude, and he, he, he's a good dude. He's still, he's still doing time, but yeah, it was just. Cool. It was all a game to me up until then, cause I'm making a name for myself. I ended up getting in something a couple weeks after that. Yeah. I uh, went on lockup. I was on lockup. I ended up stabbing a CEO on lockup for saying I shit in the shower, which wasn't true. Like I just waited for them to come. They beat the shit out of me for like three weeks. They were mm -hmm. spitting in my food every time. I mean, I had to like two weeks of not eating. They came to my. I had it made up in my mind. They can spit in this tray right in front of me. As long as they don't put shit in it, I'm eating it. Yeah, yeah. I was starving, all beat up. They sent me to Supermax. And uh, you know that that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to make my name. I was in Supermax. I ended up filing a lawsuit about the loaf. If you've been in, you oh, know the about loaf. the loaf. Yeah. So they they, oh, I did a lot of reading. I I I, I like to read. Even as a kid, I like to read. My uncle nice. used to buy me books. Yeah. And so I'm looking at the loaf from a different angle. They gave me and my cell buddy the loaf for popping the feed up slot. But the officer says we both popped. The ticket says we both popped at the same time. We end up beating the ticket. And I looked at it from a whole different angle because they give you the loaf before because they say it's punitive. It's, it's, it's not punitive. It's uh, management or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I ended up filing a lawsuit on it. And I didn't go under cruel and unusual punishment where everybody else goes because if anybody's ate the loaf, you know it's cruel and unusual punishment. Right. So yes, just to reiterate, for those that don't know what the loaf is, 
loaf is usually they put you on the loaf if you throw food on a pol- police officer, you do some shit you ain't supposed to do. They take all your food, they blend it, and they make it look like a meatloaf. So you have all your protein, vegetable, texture, uh, 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 dessert, all in one, <laughs> mixed up like a bread loaf, and that's how you eat it. It is the most horrible Crazy. thing ever. Go ahead, Bobby. I, like, I, but I ended up doing reverse psychology was that I would ask to get, I would make them put me on it. So eventually it became not a punishment. So I would try to get put on the loaf and they wouldn't give it to me, wow. even though it was just reverse psychology. Yeah. But anyway, I filed a lawsuit under uh, due process for it. So in prison, you still have some rights. Right. I filed it. I went to the inmate grievance office. They agreed with me. I was in supermax for stabbing a correctional officer. I had to be in there for five years. And the uh, commissioner of corrections came to me and said, look, if you drop your lawsuit, we'll let you out of here. We'll send you to the Maryland House of Corrections Annex. And that's where I started my bid at, right? And it was Maryland House of Corrections Annex is all lifers. If you got life without parole, you couldn't leave there. And so I'm like, oh, you gonna let me out of here? Oh shit, let's go. So no. while I was still in Supermax though, is where the realization came to me of what was going on. I remember I'm watching uh, Kelly Clarkson on uh, Ellen or something, I forget who it was. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking and she's talking about walking around the house naked on Sundays. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, I ain't never gonna see a woman walk around naked on Sundays, like that's crazy. Mm -hmm. And so I start looking at my case. By this time I'm doing heroin all the time in there. I'm high, itching and scratching on the floor looking and I noticed I had to get new transcripts and I noticed five pieces of paper. Like I knew my transcripts by heart, how many pieces of paper, but with the new ones, I got five new pieces. And with that was one of my victims, five statements, the only victim who gave a statement, five statements saying they didn't know who did it, couldn't see them, couldn't tell, and this was over like a 17 day period. And then the fifth statement is, yeah, Bobby did it, he came to rob my sons, blah, blah, blah. So that was a Brady violation. And, and now I found my way out. And this was all, well, I hope it was my way out, all playing. Now, mind you, I done caught a ton of charges in prison. Yeah. And uh, so I'm just sitting, I'm like, damn, I might find a way out. I had this old dude write it up for me. I went to court and gave my time back. And then uh, they offered me 15, but now I had to worry about all the sentences I caught in all prison being stuff, wild. Yeah. And then the realizations hit me that, damn, I might have fucked up in here. Like, this might have been pretty stupid. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it, it That's wants that to, growth and development yeah, at yeah, that time. Yeah. So, it, could you, like, just quickly, too, man, um, because, like, you know, we shared earlier, Anthony shared with you, I did 27 years and six months in New York State Prison. And in there, I seen some really, really gruesome stuff that, that went on between just us, the prisoners, you know, as well as the guards, you know. Yeah. Um, can you... Th- you know, share any moments that you remember, like the most gruesome thing that you've seen occur, and and because I, you know, I've never been in Baltimore prisons, man, but I heard a lot about Baltimore. I know so many people in there. But if you could, if you could, I, I've witnessed, I'm gonna say five murders. One of them was that I got sent to the Maryland House of Corrections Annex, waiting to go home. Two dudes that I was actually, I was actually cool with them, because a lot of people used to think I was, I was a blood in the beginning. BSV, because they were just, them dudes had so much respect. They were always sending me down. Yeah. And uh, I, they became internal beef. And I watched a dude with like 63 days get killed right in front of my door. Mm-hmm. And he was getting ready to go home. Um, I've been shit down, coming out of lockup, coming out of the shower, dude shit me down. That right there is horrible. Uh, throwing up, you, you smell you smell it for days. Oh, it's yeah. but. Yeah. You got people down there that just don't like. I've seen dudes shitting themselves down. I've seen people commit suicide, cut themselves. I've, I've seen a lot of crazy shit no that, you know, the normal people like. When I tell people stories about prison, they're like, and and I'm just normal with it. And, yeah, fuck that's how it is in New York State. It was like second nature to us. It's something that that this is what happens. And like I said, I was groomed for that. Like I knew this was coming. I seen people get shot yeah. on the street. I shot people. So it was just it's 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 all cold to me where. As I started getting around normal people, I noticed that I'm not normal. Like shit, yeah. that, shit that bothers me, them don't bother me. I'm I'm not normal. I'm I'm, I'm kind of fucked up in the head. Yeah. And that's let's, good let's, that you could identify that. Yeah, let let let's talk about that growth and development because I think a lot of people don't address the mental illness. 
um, aspect of doing time, the trauma, the PTSD, the uh, depression state, the uh, things that come along with that, right? Yeah. Um, I think we kind of like sweep it underneath the rug and we don't address it. And like right now, you just you just literally addressed it, and people a lot of people have a hard time, and they they don't understand that when you're open and honest and telling people like I'm really mm-hmm. fucked up, like I may present well, I may come off good, yeah. but truth of the matter, I tell people like yo, it took me a long time, right. a long time, especially when I was detoxing off of drugs, the fucking nightmares. Yeah. Those nightmares that all of a sudden just creep into your mind and at, at night of the shit that you've done, that you experienced, that you witnessed, like it comes, right? And I have those moments of PTSD a lot. And like how how do you deal with that? I right, when somebody tell you, Man, you're a good person, Bobby <laughs> You're a good person, Bobby. Yeah. You know what I mean? You a real good normal dude, right? You just look at them and be like You got you no only what know. I've done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> And, and I'm going to say, like, I, I suppressed it with drugs for a long time. Like, that, that was my way out. I found heroin, and that was, I ain't have a care in the world when I found that. But then, you know, that can only last, like, the fun of that only lasts for so long. Mm-hmm. And then you start going down. Like, I came home from prison with a heroin habit. My mother, who had would have had 28 years clean yesterday, got me in a halfway house, and I admitted I was a drug addict. But... I wasn't ready to do anything about it. Like, I had this image. I was 25, 26 when I came home. I had this image, and I couldn't let nobody think. I, I, I had this whole plan I was going to check because my mother had been in recovery my whole life since I was 14. And so she got clean three years after my father died, and I had this plan. I was going to come home. I was going to have my own meeting. I was going to chair conventions. Like, I was going to do everything. I was going to be Mr. Recovery. Yeah. And I came home, and dudes that I respected, I see them sharing, like, dudes who you know did some things. And i will be like, Damn, I can't let nobody think anything happened to me in prison that I don't want to go back. It was yeah. the dumbest reason ever yeah. not to stay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. but if I come out here and be perfect gentleman, now people gonna think something happened to me in prison. Right, and mm-hmm. that we can't have that. A so lot of people don't understand that. That, that yeah. led me right back, and you know, it's a struggle. Yeah, the, the second it, time was uh, that was kind of fun too because while I was in there, like I said, a lot of people thought I was blood. Some friends of mine started an organization called Dead Man Incorporated. And I always said I wouldn't join a gang. I didn't want to be in a gang. I rolled solo. Everything I ever did was solo. Mm-hmm. I get I get back into Maryland House Crush and look, we started this thing called DMI, and it's only like 50 people, right? It's just a whole bunch of white dudes that put in work for the BGF. We were hitmen. And I was like, oh, fuck it. I'll join that. You know what I mean? Who no. cares? We just all homeboys from the neighborhood. It's just like, and when I came back in in 07, DMI had blown up to like it was you were constantly seeing news reports everything it, it had blown up way beyond what anybody thought it would mm-hmm. for a small predominantly white prison gang like it wasn't black dudes Spanish dudes it wasn't a racial gang but yeah. it was it was predominantly white dudes from South Baltimore Southwest Baltimore Dundalk that sort of thing and I came back in and we had blown up and, and my name was there so now I got rank and I'm just yeah. calling shots and I'm like and it's like, all right, this is it's kind of all right too. Right. You know what I mean? This this is even better than I ain't got to put in work no more. I can yeah. just chill. People bringing me stuff. I got people looking out for me on the yard. And then the second time I came home, the second time, and I knew after I came home that time that I you know, I kind of didn't want to go back again, right? Mm-hmm. But drugs came again. You know, trying to cover up for you know beefing with this girl and and this and that and trying to find ways to suppress everything. I don't even think it was. I'm, I'm going to say that even though I suppressed a lot, a lot of it was my father's death. Like, that's where the mental, like, finding my father dead was, yeah. was crazy. Like, yeah. that's something. At that point, I, actually, earlier than that, I found my uncle dead of an overdose. So I, I've been finding people dead for a long time, and, and that kind of fucks you up. Like, I've seen more dead bodies before 14 than a lot of people see in their whole life. Mm-hmm. Well, here's what I want to go, because I know you spoke about your dad and us touching the prison and everything like that. What's your relationship with your mom? Because, my, like, my, you just mentioned the recovery and stuff like my that. My mother just passed last month from cancer. Oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that. Yes. Deepest condolences. Yeah, it came out of nowhere. Wow. So, but it was it was a good relationship. Talked to my mother. I mean, my first sure. prison bit was, I did almost 10 years. My mother told me, because she was in recovery, she was going to use the tough love. Look, when you go in there, don't call me. Yeah. Don't call me, don't write me, don't nothing. And so my first 10-year bit was every Christmas, Every birthday, a $50 money order, 
with no return address, no letter, no nothing. But then when it was time to come home, my mother found out I was getting out. Come on, we're going to help you. We're going to set you up. Like I said, my stepfather, my stepfather always never treated me any different, even though he had every right to. Right. I mean, I kind of fucked that man. Well, made his life hectic. Like, police right. are kicking the door, putting him on the ground. He's outside cooking steaks. Police are raiding the right. house. And I don't even live there, so he had every right to be like, man, I ain't fucking with this kid. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, still to this day, I talked to him the other day. Still, My stepfather has never treated me different. I think he took my my brother's death. My brother overdosed in 2009 right after I came home. I hadn't seen him in years. And that day I got to see him by, we crossed paths at my mother's house by accident. And he told me, hey, I, I got some whatever kind of pills he had. I still to this day have never done an opiate pill. But I got this and I was joking, oh man, let me get some, you know what yeah. I mean? Like little, little bitch ass shit. Yeah. And I leave and the next day they find my brother dead. So uh, I held that. I joked with him about what killed him, you know, but I didn't yeah. look at, I grew up with heroin. I didn't even know what pills really, because in Baltimore, we didn't do pills. Yeah. I thought it, that's all, shit, that's easy stuff. Yeah. You know, you can't die from that. Right. And uh, I think my stepfather took his death harder than my mother. And then, you know, my mother got cancer. She got diagnosed on Mother's Day. By July, she was in hospice. And uh, for four months, my stepfather sat by her side. Didn't go to work, didn't do nothing. His job told him stay. Yeah. Like, you, you won't lose your job. We obviously just can't pay you past your, your sick leave. But he didn't leave her side for four months. That's a lot of different trauma. A lot yeah. that's going on, yeah. you know, with, with, with one person. Like, you take on a lot. So I always say, too, because I think a lot of us grow up with similarities in life, you know just running through life with our families, friends, whatever it may be. It's a lot of similarities with, with everyone's story yeah. that, that come from the streets, you know, whatever state you in, wherever you at, you know. So that's, that's, um, that's you know, I understand that too. Um, just at the same time, listening to it, I, I also know that, you know, there's this periods in life that you, and you, you was just speaking about it that you kind of, you know, like, damn, but do I want to keep doing this? Do I want to keep doing that? You know, so if you could share that, you know, last time when you was that like growth and development. Done. So it, it, it actually happened over two stages. I came to Florida, I got out of prison again in 2011, so I'd already served 15 years. And I come down, almost 15. I come down here, right down here, I meet this girl down here. You know, it's, it, it's all good. Like, one of the best girls I've somebody who kept like spreadsheets of finances and like looked at their checkbook it was something I'd never seen before and yeah she, she come to find out later she never seen anything like me before she learned some shit about me and she's like damn like you know not knowing how to order cheese at the grocery store and shit right it's just just weird things right. that I never had to do and uh so we get together we're happy we move and I'm like damn Florida you know how the hell do you even get high living down here? Like, look at this place. Because coming from where well, yeah. we, we don't have that. I went. I don't even like the ocean, and I went to the beach every day. Mm -hmm. Like, I just like being out in the water, even though I don't. I can't swim. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I slowly we together. We had a house. I decided. Uh, I joked because we would order a carpet cleaner to clean car house every like three months and we didn't have a lot of money she was in college I worked at an auto body shop and I made a joke one day that I was gonna uh, I was gonna put on Facebook anybody wants your cars cleaned I'm gonna do it that way we can pay for the carpet cleaner so we ain't coming out of pocket for it yeah. and uh, it ended up not going that way I ended up going to get a dog we weren't supposed to have we ended up getting evicted for this dog but we weren't giving our dog up and um, I, so I went to the pawn shop and bought a $10 carpet cleaner this little $10 stand-up piece and put on Facebook. Anybody want your car clean? I'm doing this. I'm doing full details for like $7,500 or whatever. The first weekend, I made like $600. The next weekend, I made $600 on Saturday, $600 on Sunday. I'm like, damn, I got something here. And so I just start pushing that and then watching myself <laughs> grow as a business, like forming an LLC, uh, my man Charlie, Charlie Posner, shout out to him, seen something in me. I didn't even know this dude like that. He knew a friend, he was a friend of my sponsor. And he seen what I was doing and came to me and was like, I want to invest in you. Nice. And he so I got a trailer, I got a real carpet cleaner, everything I needed. And I'm looking at myself, damn, I'm a, I'm a business now, right? You know, I, I can do Sorry. this. But I still didn't have faith in myself for this. Like, I just knew this was going to collapse at some point. There's no way 
I yeah. never knew anyone to start a business, and I'm going to be the first one. So I, I just had complete doubt in it, like waiting every day for it to fold. And so eventually I'm clean, and then I see a friend of mine, and he pulls up on me. Man, I probably had like two years clean. Damn, Bobby, you're doing so good. Proud of you, bro, the way we always knew you would do it. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of weeks later, I wanted to get high, and I called him like, yo, I'm trying to get high. He's like, all right, where you at? I'll be there in 15 minutes. And all that, I'm proud of you, you doing this shit went out the window. I ended up overdosing that day. And uh, that, the business was gone within three weeks. Like everything was, I, I was going to people's houses with 10 buckets of water. And I started without a trailer carrying buckets. Of, I'm throwing water on people's cars. I'm washing their cars and throwing water on them. Like I had to take people's cars to the gas station to vacuum, but I'm trying to get that money. Like, yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm just doing whatever hustle, it takes. Yeah, I remember one day a lady thought I stole her car because I took it to my apartment. Because I didn't have change for the vacuum cleaning. She ain't had no change in the ashtray for me to use. So I took it to my apartment and I ran out of gas on the way back. <laughs> and I'm like, but me, you know, I can't be honest. So I'm I, I, it was very simple. I she knew I was taking it to the, I could have just said, you know what, I ran out of gas. Now I'm like, I'm, I'm on the way back right now. So uh, yeah, I lied, my, I lied my way in there looking like I stole the car. But after that, you know, what we'll come as soon as soon as soon as the money runs out, the hustle runs out, I'm going back to crime. I'm going back to what I know. You know, I'm out here running, robbing, breaking bonds with the girl I'm with, her mother, everything else just going crazy. And eventually, uh a crime I didn't do, but I had a part of because I pawned it. I didn't know the guy did this. And uh a burglary, I, I pawn some stuff. I even get hurt upon some stuff because I lose my ID. And naive, back into the cycle, not knowing. So a couple weeks later, we find out that it's her boss's stuff. Her boss's house was burglarized. I had the guy come to the house while I was detailing his boat, and the guy went back and broke in the house. So he stole some stuff out of the garage. I I knew he stole the stuff out of the garage. We're dope sick. He actually brought me some. I'm like, man, take them drills, pawn them. Let's go. But I didn't know he went back and burglarized the house, hmm. and I pawned it. So she pawned some stuff, like, and uh, you know, it's honestly the best thing that ever happened. Like the worst part of that was waking up, dope sick, emotions, mm -hmm. and knowing that she had a career, she had everything. She was a civil engineer, worked at engineering firm, good job, and now she's sitting at gun club with me because of something I did. Like, I should have never got her to pawn that mm -hmm. stuff. Like, even if I knew it was his, mm -hmm. I should have never got her to pawn that. Mm -hmm. right. And so that that was the realization right there. Like, I'm, I'm laying in there, I'm like, damn, I fucked up. Like, I'm dead wrong for this. And and that was that was what woke me up to that. So I ended up doing four years here. She got bailed out. I tried to, my first offer was 30 years. And I was like, cool, just drop the charges on her. I'll take this and I'll, I'll go up the road. And the victim didn't want to do it. The victim wanted her to go to jail because mm -hmm. she said she masterminded it and all yeah. this stuff, right? Even though she knew absolutely nothing yeah. about it, yeah. you know? And uh, I went to prison and I came home. And when I came home, like, she stood by me through the whole time. And I was like, when I came home, I wasn't going to start detailing again because the money, the cash was so, it was like drug money. It comes yeah. so, and if I knew what I would make, what I would make what I make now, I never would have started detailing because I would be scared that it would be a trigger. And I started this business here, and I just start, went on Facebook and start pushing it, sending friend requests, posting my pictures, and yeah. trying to be proper in the beginning. And uh, you know, I ended up getting this large clientele base, and slowly my name creating, and it was a strictly word of mouth business for four years, and it, nice. it just blew up beyond anything I ever thought. And now let's fast forward by real quick, right? We're running out of time here, right? Because I want, I want people to see this picture, right? How long have you been doing OC Detailer now? The OC Detailer has been since July 2019. 2019, right? So we got a young kid that was from Baltimore, did all this stuff. Right? He uh, did my car, ceramic coating. It's amazing. He does a lot of my friends' cars, right? So you take a person that's been through all that, right? It's the, the definition of success, right? With everything that he's been through. If you go on the Facebook page, one thing I can tell you about Bobby, He's very thorough on what he does. He's very responsible and accountable now. He's a prankster. He's funny. He gets off the wall shit on Facebook. Like yes, he has be posting like if I was to post some of the shit that like, he posts, right? My wife would literally wait for me as soon as I come in the door to shank me in my neck. Right? But I love his personality. Yeah. But not only that, 
he built he 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 built the trust of the community. He works on hundred thousand dollar cars. Okay, like some of the cars that he he works on is listen. You can only put it on your wish list and just look at it and just keep wishing until you get your ass up mm -hmm. to get some work to try to buy one. Right, and I'm talking about some Kanishas. We're talking about, you know, 918 Spiders. We're talking about, you know, all, all luxury high-end cars. Um, Bobby, right, I want to say thank you, you know what I mean, for coming out here, being so open and honest about what's going on and your transition from where you came from and where you at now, right? I want you to let the people know out here in Florida, how can they get in touch with you, right? What is it that you offer that's different from everybody else that wants to do detailing, right? Why do you stand behind your work? Well, reach me at 561-543-6849, uh, Instagram, TH3 underscore OC Detailer, and Facebook is the oc detailer And... Uh, you know, I just come in and I figured that if I stand by my work, you know, if I mess something up, I just stand by it, I fix it, I just go in there, be thorough, and if I do it right, and I can, I can build, like, just doing the right thing, not trying to cover things up. You know, I'm, I've messed some cars up, I've messed some Rolls Royces up, I've messed some Audis up, and I just, as <laughs> soon as I do, is, hey, I did this, how do I fix this, how much does it cost, let me know, I'm going to fix it, because accidents happened a long time ago, I would have tried to cover it up. But now I just go in, I created a method for doing it that's thorough, just making sure the best outcome and, you know, just, just standing by my way. Like, I can't see, I don't offer a car wash because I can't see myself just leaving dirt on a car anywhere. Like, I don't offer a wash and vacuum because I wouldn't be able to not wipe the dash. And that's going to open up a whole new thing. Once I wipe the dash, wipe the steering wheel, and I'm going to be in a car for two hours. Yeah, no question. So right. that's where it comes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, I, 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 I can definitely attest to that. You know, like I said, Bobby did my car, had a little accident on it. He called me right immediately. And go get it, tell me what the price is. I got it done, water under the bridge, right? Shit happens, right? The accountability, he came back after I got it fixed, did another throw. I was actually in New York last, last week, got him on camera, in front of my house. Yeah, <laughs> got you on camera, motion sensor. Hey, he fixed the car. You know what I mean, so anybody that's out there that knows Bobby OCD tell man, not only is he in recovery, not only is he funny, not only is he, you know, responsible and accountable, I would recommend them. If you really care about your car and you work hard to get the things that you have and you want to take care of it, please hit up Bobby OCD tell yo. He's a good dude. He gives back. And real quick, I want to touch on that, you know what I mean, your, your Christmas drive that yeah. you do every year for everybody that's out here in Florida, man. Listen, when you see his post on Facebook and he's asking, you know, for donations if you want to give back to your community. I've seen it for myself. I know people who have contributed to it this year. I will be contributing to it. You can hold me to that. AMC Premier Wellness. We will be giving a contribution because, again, that's nothing better than giving back to your community and to these kids that don't have it like we had when we was growing up or didn't have. No question. Um, and I just I just want to take a minute just to thank you for your stories. Mm -hmm. You know, just to, you know, thank you for that because like when we created this platform, the platform was created for us to, you know, get those stories out, people like yourself and and myself that's formerly incarcerated yeah. that and just to 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 debunk the myth in the stereotype in society that society has of people that's formerly incarcerated yeah. that we go home and come back and we do, this is this is what our life is and that's it you know you you showing us today you know our followers you know families the world that you know on success after lockdown that that we you know you can't just put us in that box you know of of going to prison and that's it your life is over you're never gonna be nothing, you know. We show we show today that you know there is success after being locked down, yeah. and and you're a prime example of that, and a prime example of giving back to the community. So we not only staying home, we, you know, we not only out here staying out here, we also doing something positive for the community. And I want to th thank you for that out here in Florida, thank you know, doing your part in life because. It, like you, we just talked about, man, the different traumas that we have. 
you know, that, that we go through in life growing up. And for us to be able to come out of that and still succeed yeah. in life, man, and come up. And, and like you say, I'm, right now I'm going through that too, man, with just, you know, uh, learning how to pump gas, like using a card. Like when I was on, yeah. we didn't have phones. We didn't have, I had the box phone in the car. Like yeah. I come home to all this, I'm still learning this stuff. You know what I mean? You know, but it's a it's a beautiful challenge for me because it's a new journey. It's a new beginning. And that's what I see in your life, you know, um, that new challenge, that new beginning in life. And so I appreciate meeting you today too, man. Appreciate and, it. Appreciate meeting you. All you're respect. Glad what you're all doing. All respect to you. Thank you. And with that being said, I want to say thank you to all those that are out there, man, that's been tuning in to us in season one, who's still following us, staying faithful, man. We thank you. Keep watch, man. Like I said, the objective here is to change the stigma on formerly incarcerated men and women that the world want to see us as by our mistakes, but not as the work that we're putting in today. Right? We do change. We do recover. And we do have a right to give back to our communities. Give us a chance and you can see. Don't judge everybody by a book or by its cover, man. Okay? And with that said, you can continue following us on YouTube, yeah. on Success After Lockdown, on Facebook, TikTok. We're on TikTok, on all social media. <laughs> but you can find us on Anchor, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube on the Success After Lockdown. Facts. I'm your host, Anthony Colon. TikTok. And this is my boy, EB. No you question. You already know, Mr. Benson. So... Yeah. Anybody want to come on our show? Keep tuning in. And if you have somebody that you know that's out there that's successful, please shoot us an email. You can reach it at successafterlockdown at, at gmail.com. Gmail um, tell their story. We'll get in touch with you. And we'll love to have them on the air, no matter where you're at, what state you are. With that being said, yo, salute to all those out there. Stay up. 2024, make it a great year. Peace and blessings. Let's go to the beach now. Boom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>